going in. We're going to give it just another minute. I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll. Um, just kind of helps us identify who we're actually talking to today. But thanks for taking time out of your Wednesday uh, for learning about some different tests that you should be looking at um, when analyzing your beer. So if you can go ahead and begin the poll. Um, I'll share the results in just a moment. Looks like we've got a lot of brewers. Um, we've got some home brewers, QAQC staff. Looks like overwhelmingly brewers, though. Awesome. If you have any questions that we can't get to, you can definitely go ahead and email Kara or myself, and um, we're happy to keep the conversation going. Uh, my name is Eric Fowler. I'm the education manager. Uh, Kara, thank you for taking uh, some time today to, uh, you know, speak speak on some of our favorite tests that we, you know, promote time and time again, and, and really hope that people take to heart and implement in their process. If you want to um, introduce yourself and what you do. Hi, yeah, I'm um, Kara Taylor. I'm our head of lab operations, and um, I've been at White Labs for 12 years, so you've probably seen me on some other video or around or whatever, but um, yeah, I wanted to kind of discuss some of the lab analysis or some of the tests that we um, really recommend that people do either at a home brain level or even just at a professional level because um, they're important in helping you look at your beer. So we'll talk about that today. Well, cool. so, you know, why why gather data at all? Really, it's a pretty broad topic, right? And I think it's something that's um, overlooked quite a bit until breweries um, start to mature a little bit, when in fact, you know, a lot of what you're going to be talking about is, are things that we hope people start thinking about before ever brewing a beer. So why, why should brewers and brewery operations um, look at data collection um, and what should they be hoping to get out of it? Yeah, so I, you know, I really recommend that people do some of these analysis and then also, I mean, at that time, right, you're gathering this data, you're writing it down. Um, and I think really one of the main reasons I see is through troubleshooting. It's really, really difficult to help out people when they have issues with their fermentations or when they have, um, you know, stuck fermentations or they just don't like the flavor of something, it, it can be really hard if you don't have any data to be able to look at. Um, and I'll kind of talk about where those data points should exist, you know, as we go through these, um, these topics. Um, but the second part is consistency. And I think this part is probably the more obvious one, but I think we don't always think about it. Um, just like this last weekend, not brewing related, but I was trying to recreate a recipe that I did at Christmas. And I realized like I wrote down nothing that I had done. And I just like, I, I wanted to recreate this tri-tip I made and I, I couldn't. Um, and so I think like, ultimately you might think you're gonna remember of how, you know, how something turned out, but then when you need to kind of look back at that, um, you know, it, it's really nice to be able to have that data, even if you're not actively using it um, in, that, in that moment in time. The last part that I think that a lot of people don't think about either is from a regulatory standpoint. Obviously, if you're a home brewer, that's not really something you're thinking about. But if you are have a professional brewery um, and someone wanted to inspect your brewery, some of these data points are necessary um, for regulatory things. Um, alcohol is obviously one of them. Um, when I started at White Labs 10 years ago, I couldn't believe how many people weren't taking gravity readings just to even um, understand like what their alcohol volume is at each, you know, at, for each batch, they're just sort of like, well, this recipe usually gives us X. Um, I think people have matured past that these days, but um, there is, you know, some element of regulatory there. So, I mean, there's obviously sometimes death by information and the amount of data points that can be presented can be overwhelming, but, you know, most of the time when us as a supplier are hearing about any issue like you said it's it can be difficult to diagnose what actually happened but it can also be difficult to at that point come up with a solution to save the product so when you're looking at all this data collection are you mostly looking at being proactive or reactive um, 
Um, it's a little bit of both. And I think I'll go through that for each of those, each of the, the data points. I think there's some of this data that can help you understand maybe where something went wrong. And then I think there's also data points that can help you within that, in that um, fermentation or within that brewing process can help you determine where that, that beer is going to sort of end up. Awesome. So, you know, the first one that I wanted to outline is pH, because I think, um, you know, this, I don't know if everyone would sort of say that this is the most important, but this is by far the largest data, po data point that when I ask people when they are having issues with a fermentation or a beer flavor, they don't have this information. And it always sort of sur surprises me. Um, the reason that I love pH so much is it's a really good indication of that fermentation is happening. If you think about other industries like wine, um, things that don't like a lot of um, fermented products that don't have a lot of protein, you don't get this like active bubbling Krausen on a lot of products. And so the way that you know fermentation is happening um, in addition to, I mean, there's some other ways, right? But one of them is just to see how that pH is dropping. So that pH should be going, you know, lower, it should be becoming more acidic. And that's a good indication that you have fermentation happening there. Um, it's really a good tool to troubleshoot those fermentations. And what that requires you to do is to have a starting and a final pH. So if you only have that final pH, which a lot of brewers only have, it doesn't really give me too much indication of what happened there if you if you need some troubleshooting right so if there's some weird some weirdness with the flavor profile um, or if you have some oxidation if i don't have at least a starting ph and a final ph it's it's really hard to figure that out additionally if you can have a ph like a graph of the ph over the course of that fermentation it's even better um, because you've probably seen, if you look at your, your final pH over the course of a fermentation and at the end, you know, the pH starts to rise up and it starts going up and up and up and you're like, oh, that's kind of weird. That's usually because you've got, you know, a lot of cell death happening, right? So there's, there might be some indication of um, autolysis or some yeast cell death, right? Maybe contributing to the flavor. Um, but there's also um, an element of like, you don't know where maybe that final pH was at the end of the fermentation before that you started dying. So having a graph of that is, can be, or just even, you know, five or six data points over the course of that fermentation can really be helpful in, in troubleshooting. Do you think it's, you know, would you add emphasis on taking pH readings in that, that initial onset of fermentation that those first 48 hours or yeah. spreading those Cool. Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, a lot of people only have the mash pH, but they don't have that starting pH for the, the actual fermentation. Um, and I do think that is important, um, especially, I mean, there's more obvious times where pH is important when you're doing something like a kettle sour and you're trying to, you know, you know, get some lactic acid happening. But pH can also be a really good indicator that you have a contamination if you're brewing a similar recipe. So if a lot of your recipes start at the same pH and they're, you know, maybe the, the grain bill is similar, your water profile is similar, your final pHs should be also similar. Um, and so if, if for some reason that final pH is creeping lower and lower, um, you it, it can also be the first sign that you have some type of contamination without even having to look at a microscope or even looking at, um, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, looking at any type of uh, plating. It's, and, sorry, go ahead. Uh, what type, what ranges of, of finishing pH are, are common and is that going to vary based on yeast strain? So you mentioned contamination. Uh, could that be an indicator of other organisms there or is there even a slight difference in different, say, ale strains? A hundred percent. So you're going to have different P, final pHs just, even if you have the same wort you got a different yeast, you're going to have different pHs. And that's because you're going to have different acids being made by those different yeast strains. Um, is, you know, two different versions of Cal Ale going to be that different? Probably not. But something like a Saison strain versus Cal Ale, you're going to see a little bit of a difference there. Um, 
And it in that final pH is always going to depend on what your starting pH is. So if those are different, um, you know, that's going to be your, your final pHs are never going to be, or, or it's, it's going to be rare that they're going to be the same. Um, one of the things to just remember is that in beer is considered by the FDA to be, to be a acidified food. So pH is actually what makes um, beer food safe in addition to the ethanol that um, is created. So between those two things, we're considered to be um, acidified foods and so we have less regulations. But if you're finding that you're making beers and they're not getting below 4.6, um, which is that basically that threshold, um, that might be an indicator that, you know, like you just, you wanna, you wanna sort of dial in your recipes so that you're at least that finishing pH is, is under 4.6 there. Um, I recently worked with a customer that, you know, they had all these weird flavor issues. They couldn't quite pinpoint it. Um, but the only data point I had was that, um, that stuck out to me was that the final pH was close to five. And um, while that could be an issue from cell death, I didn't have any other data points to really like go off of to help figure that out, right? So I couldn't quite, quite help them too much. But it was a good indicator that something had gone wrong there. So that could be cell death or not a whole lot of uh, yeast growth as well, right? And, but you'd probably see other correlating well, factors if that were the issue. You would see if there wasn't, if the fermentation didn't happen, um, like if you didn't have full attenuation, you would see that with the gravity. Um, but another indicator could have been that um, there was potential like residual caustic um, in, in a line when something got transferred. Um, granted, they probably would have had to have like a lot of, of that in there, but um, yeah, it's, it's, there's a couple different potential reasons why that might happen. Totally makes sense. Cool. Number two, your personal favorite. <laughs> Diacetyl, yeah. I, um, I think that this is something that everyone really can be doing um, is looking at is easily doing diacetyl. And even if you're a home brewer, this is something you can easily do, um, you know, just on a stovetop. Essentially what we're trying to do is take all of that precursor, um, that alpha acetolactate, and we're trying to convert it to diacetyl at some point um, in that fermentation, usually, you know, near the end to make sure that the diacetyl isn't showing up in our beers later. And this used to be, you know, it, it was only lagers that we had to deal with, but I think a lot of people are controlling their fermentations on ales at lower temperatures because they like the flavor profile, a lot of them. And so um, when you're fermenting beers at you know, 63, 64, it's always good to try to do a forced diacetyl test on that, just to make sure that you don't need to, to raise the temperature up a little bit there. So, you know, obviously one of the main things that this is, is it's not going to be, it's not going to be quantitative. It's not going to give you a number of, you know, parts per billion, um, you know, of diacetyl. So you've got to be able to use your nose to do this. So you, you yourself might not be the best person to be able to detect the buttered popcorn flavor. Um, but I think like you've got to find someone maybe in your family or your friends that if you're not that person that can that can taste and smell the diacetyl. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's something that everyone can implement and takes, you know, really minimal amount of time. So just to sort of like quickly give you an overview, but there's a lot of information, including our website of like how to do this test, but you're just taking two samples, you're heating one of them um, in a water bath of some sort. And you can do that on a stovetop. You can do that with a sous vide cooker. Um, there's a lot of different ways. And uh, basically then you cool them to the same temperature side by side and you smell them. So if you do find that that, that heated sample has some diacetyl there, that means you've got some precursor and you've got to raise that temperature up, right? To, to convert that precursor um, so the yeast can, can consume it. How important is um, like decanting your sample and just ensuring that there's not a lot of trube and yeast in there. Cause you know, often like when I've done forced acid, I get a lot of other, like you say, acetaldehyde, is that something I should be looking for 
in a forced diastole test or what are the considerations regarding that? Yeah, that's one of the things that makes this test a little bit difficult is that you're often, um, there's also, you know, some fusels or any other kind of off flavors will become, when heated, will become a little bit um, intense. And so if you do have a lot of yeast in that sample, you can get a lot of autolysis also. So I definitely recommend trying to put it through a coffee filter or multiples um, before you, you do that so that it doesn't sort of throw you off. But usually if you can cool them down to either room temperature or just right below, that will help um, reduce some of those other uh, higher, those volatile compounds. Um, and then also just something to, to recommend is just to not microwave that sample because they are volatile. Um, you can boil that off really easily. Although I, I've heard of people using that just fine, but I, it's something I don't typically recommend. Cool, so this is obviously a pretty affordable tests or are, are there any other are there lab tests that will associate a number with the levels of diacetyl or that precursor yeah of course you know you could always like send it to us and we can give you those those actual values there um and we've done that especially for breweries that have a hard time you know there's a maybe they have a panel and they're all sort of arguing over whether or not um, it has diacetyl or not, because some of those caramel flavors um, or caramel malts can kind of give you this false diacetyl perception. But, um, but ultimately, yeah, like in the lab, in a, in a normal QC lab, it's, it's not super easy to do um, without a gas chromatograph. But I think, um, you know, really why I think this is so important is it's a huge part of you know, having diacetyl in a finished product just really sucks. You know, it's like you've worked so hard to like this great fermentation and then that's sort of the end product. It can be really overwhelming for some people. It can make things taste really sweet. And so I think it's basically, you know, it, it doesn't take very much time at all to be able to look at that. I do know breweries that use this test as their as their way of saying that the, the beer is complete versus just looking at the gravities. Um, and so, you know, in addition to gravity, they want to make sure that fermentation is complete, but they also want to make sure that the diacetyl is reduced. Um, and so I think that is a, is a really good practice for people if, um, if this tends to be an issue with some of your beers. That makes sense. Cool. So um, contamination is something that I think is really is, is becoming less and less prevalent over the years, which I think is awesome. Um, you know, I think people are understanding cleaning procedures. They're almost to the point where, you know, it's like over the top. And I, but I think those are, are great practices to have. Um, but I think a really good way, if you don't want to invest in a huge micro program is looking at HLP. Um, it stands for um, SUS, Lacto, and Pedio Media. And basically it's just this really easy lacto and PDO um, contamination uh, uh, detector. And that, you know, the, the media, it looks like in that little bottle there, it's basically sort of in a liquid gel form. You microwave it and you're, you add it to a wort sample, to a beer sample, to a yeast sample. And ultimately you don't want anything to grow, but if you do, um, you know, that photo there with the, you know, the test tube, basically shows you these little uh, white dots in there and you'll have some, you know, growth that will help you determine if that's, you know, you've got an issue. Occasionally it will grow some other things like wild, some wild yeast will grow into it. Um, but also, also that's sort of, you know, helpful. And again, it doesn't really matter. You're not going to be able to de detect very well if it's lacto or PDO, but in this case, it doesn't really matter, right? We, if you've got lacto or if you've got PDO, that's something you typically don't want in a standard beer. So you should just, um, you know, take that information and, and work on cleaning procedures. Um, I think the other nice thing is it, is it doesn't really require a lot of um, other lab materials if that's just something you don't have a background in. It's, it's really, really easy to implement. So it's always the first thing I recommend if people are looking into any type of contamination analysis um, is, is using that. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's, you know, definitely easy to use. But so you're suggesting this as a first step and not something that might detect every contaminant or every possible contaminant, but really focusing on 
um, lactobacillus and pediococcus and, and not requiring uh, something like an autoclave? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, lacto and pedio are a little bit more difficult to detect at low levels in a beer than, say, something like wild yeast. We can incubate a can of beer, something really hot, and see if it's going to over attenuate um, within, you know, a week. There's other ways that we can do that. With um, lacto and pedio, it's a little bit more difficult. So I think this is a great way to be able to sort of, um, you know, test, test that sample. And so if you if you had a positive and you did see something grow in that, but your beer tastes fine, is this something that you could maybe keep the beer in house and continue to look at pH and see if there's any additional acidification there and monitor sensory as well? Yeah, what you can do is try to speed up that practice or that, that um that contamination by just storing those beers somewhere really warm. And that will, you know, lacto wants to be above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And so that it's basically going to accelerate that process. Granted, is the beer also going to taste kind of funny? You know, yes. But if you're, if you're looking to see how that beer is going to age over time, that's a great way to do it. Um, in addition to, you know, some of this early detection here. Cool. So a second way to do this, if you know, you're not quite ready to like dip your toes into into that, um, into HLP is looking at things mi microscopically, um, right? So basically using a microscope, you can just put, you know, that yeast sample or that beer sample underneath on a slide. Um, and this is just sort of a photo of what something would look like if there's multiple types of, of yeast and bacteria and things there. Bacteria, you know, this mostly you're gonna be able to see from this slide just in general is that they're gonna be these big cells um, and those are all gonna be yeast but they're, they also might be wild yeast. So if you're looking for something that's like irregularly shaped, um, that can help you determine if maybe you've got some issues with that culture or with that beer. The bacteria are gonna be much smaller there. So you might have to go up another um, slide, but sometimes if you've got a lot of lactobacillus there, you can see it easily under the microscope. I think a really good way of getting um, used to this is basically looking at a mixed culture. So if you even buy just a vial of some of our sour mixes, it'll, it's a really good way to be able to just look at like, what am I supposed to be looking for? What, what am I, what would I see if I saw Saccharomyces, you know, Britannomyces and bacteria underneath the microscope and just get more familiar with that, with those cultures, and then that can help you. Um, we often get a lot of like, people are like, oh, there's bacteria in here and they send it and it's mold. Mold makes these long, long hyphae under the microscope and it's, it's sort of difficult to describe. So as, once you start getting more um, comfortable with those things, I think it's, um, you can you easily use this as a, as a tool um, without too much um, knowledge or previous knowledge. And you say. would suggest looking at like a, a finished beer sample and processed beer sample are you looking at your slurry? What part of process should you be? Looking yeah, I think that? looking at the slurry before you pitch it is always good. Um, is it going to be perfect? No, but it can give you at least some indication of um, of what's going on, and you know, in general. And then looking at that finished beer can also um, can be could be really good. This sample here is obvious that it's you know probably more of a slurry. It's got a lot going on there. Whereas if you were to look at a finished beer sample, depending on how it's been filtered or not filtered, you know, it might not be as dense. Um, you could you could allow something to settle and maybe take a sample from the bottom of the of a test tube or a flask or something like that. Could be good. Cool. Uh, we've got some questions coming in that we'll get to in just a couple slides. Um, but yeah, I mean, talking about pH now moving to gravity, you know, there's a, a correlation in taking the samples, right, and, and trying to record these data points at the same time. But why is gravity in looking at ABV so, so important? Yeah, so this is definitely one of the ones I was talking about earlier in terms of regulatory, right? So if someone you know, if you're making any of these beers, you've got to know what that ABV is. And um, there's more and more instances now where, you know, um, ABC is just taking bottles off of the, or TTB is taking bottles off of the shelf, testing it in their lab in Maryland, and then 
sort of saying, hey, this isn't matching up, right? So it's, we have to legally, we're legally required to know this information and have it um, written down. I think also, you know, in, I, I understand that some of these things are like, this gravity seems obvious, but it can also help you really understand the refermentability of some of these beers. So if you've got a beer in that maybe you don't have full attenuation with, and maybe it, it typically does, but you package it anyways, or you send it out, um, there is an ability for that to potentially um, gush. And if you think about when you're doing something like bottle conditioning, how very little sugar you need and how much little yeast you need to basically carbonate that bottle, you really don't need much residual sugar um, simple sugars in order to have some refermentability in a can or a, in a bottle. Um, and so I think that's always something, you know, by having consistent gravities and knowing where those beers should land and what that attenuation range should be um, will really help you avoid any of those, those things in the future in terms of that. So establishing a baseline is helpful for almost anything that you're suggesting, just so you have something to measure against? Yes, exactly. So understanding what that baseline is, making sure that that beer is within those specifications. And then if it's not, you know, you can move on to some other tests to basically figure out, okay, how is this beer going to perform on a shelf that's not refrigerated or, you know, just over time? Um, you know, these things happen, I think, you know, everyone's had instances where you open a can or a bottle and it's just like, you know, gushing and it might not specifically be well yeast derived, um, but all we need is a tiny bit of still of, of sugar there and a little bit of yeast and um, it can cause a lot of, a lot of issues. Um, and we're seeing this a lot more now with like, you know, things like pastry stouts and, you know, where there's a lot more residual sugar. Um, so understanding that I think is, is good. Yeah. And then obviously, sorry, well, honestly, like, or from a consistency standpoint too, right? Just understanding where those brands should be, should be sitting is also important. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to agree with, you know, those high adjunct beers and, and the slushy beers that we see a decent amount now of having those issues and being very difficult to create that consistency and monitor that and control that, right? That re-fermentability is a, a huge issue for a lot of those types of beers. Yeah. Cool. All right, well, the last one I have is dissolved oxygen. And this is one of those ones that I think um, is much more difficult to monitor in a home brewing setting. Um, it's getting easier and easier and easier now in breweries as the cost of some of this equipment um, gets reduced. Um, but remember that in dissolved oxygen and wort, we're talking about PPM, so that's parts per million. Um, we're not looking at dissolved oxygen in terms of packaged product. While I think that is really important, um, you've added an extra layer of costs, a huge amount of costs to, to that. And I think, um, you know, that's just sort of not in the, the scope of today. But really, um, you know, I think when people are looking at dissolved oxygen, there's so many different things they're not thinking about. One is, um, if you don't have the ability to actually physically measure it, and that's where I just kind of put this um, Hawk DO meter here. I, you know, it's the one that we use internally and they've worked a lot with the brewing industry to really dial in that product. But if for some reason you're not, you know, able to, to physically measure it, making sure that your process is consistent can help you dial in what you need to do for certain beers. And um, so if you've got, you're using the same type of stone, you're doing the same amount of pressure in terms of the oxygen and the, and the time, between those things, if you can keep those things consistent and see how those fermentations perform, um, that can really help you dial that in without having any type of equipment. It's also not necessary to measure it every single time. So if you can keep those things consistent and you can borrow someone's DO meter and get someone to, you know, give you that dissolved oxygen, um, that dissolved oxygen level, and then you can kind of say, okay, I know with this process, with this equipment, this time, this temperature, this is what I'm, I'm sort of, this is where I'm, I'm at, right? Help you dial those things in. In a home brewing setting, um, the major thing I see there is 
you know, similarly, right, using different types of equipment, different styles, either splashing or, um, you know, using a, a wand. But if you're using any type of wand, um, I would definitely recommend keeping that time consistent that you're doing it for each single beer. Um, and then I also see a lot of people do it um, too early. So they're doing it really, really early, and then they don't end up um, pitching yeast until, you um, until, you know, hours later or even 30 minutes later, because you've got to think about, you know, you put that oxygen now in the wort and now it's just sitting there and, um, and then it's slowly going to start to come out of solution and, you know, out of that carboy. So you want to oxygenate, then pitch yeast, you know, relatively immediately. So the yeast have that, that dissolved oxygen there. Um, I think really if your brewery is struggling with some off flavors or inconsistencies in um, attenuation or, you know, struggling with yeast generations, this can, you know, knowing your DO um, levels can really help you dial in maybe some of those fermentation issues. And what DO range um, should brewers generally be looking for? And what ranges do you see without using specialized equipment with just using the, the, the old homebrew shake? Yeah, so I mean, you know, from a literature standpoint, eight to 13 parts per million is what we recommend. But I have found that depending on the equipment you're using, depending on where you're measuring, those numbers might be different. But if you find that you're gen generally satisfied with the, the outcome of those fermentations, I think um, you should stick with, you know, what you're, what you're measuring and what you're recording. Um, and if you're not satisfied with it, you know, try to dial those up or down. We, I have seen, um, most of the time I would find, I find that the dissolved oxygen is usually on the lower end, but I have occasionally seen people that are struggling with a lot of acetaldehyde issues that, um, are, are, are dealing with dissolved oxygen on much higher, the higher end also. Um, so, you know, they've had to, to, to reduce some of that. And a lot of this also can really come in handy if you're doing multi multiple batches or you're brewing on top of, e on top of each batch or um, you know, within consecutive days, that can be really helpful information to have for that fermentation performance. Awesome. Um, and I guess I should just mention on that last slide too, you know, I, I realize that some of that equipment can be expensive, but if you reach out to these vendors, they will often come and let you um, trial some of the equipment too, or they might come and do something for you um, to kind of show you how it might work and that can maybe help you or borrow some. So there's there's some options out there for you to be able to, to understand that a little bit more. Sorry, that's it. Awesome. I'm, I mean, I think you hit it spot on and picked my fa five favorite tests that every brewer should be performing. So yeah, I think it's funny. I didn't add cell counting to it and I thought about it a lot, but I think that um, that's like one of the more obvious ones. And I think also you can get away with not cell counting with some other consistency things, but yeah. It's a terrible thing to say to everybody, Kara. <laughs> I'm gonna take that as, as the be all end all right there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate you running through all those because I think they are really relevant and it's important to discuss, you know, in a very accessible way because it can be daunting sometimes if you, even if you look up, you know, forced acetal test, you can get, you know, pages and pages of literature on it when it, it doesn't need to be that difficult, you know, implementing something like that can be really easy and highly impactful. Um, one thing that I did want you to touch on, though, a little bit is, you know, utilizing um, third party sources such as our lab um, to kind of validate some in-house testing or maybe offering some types of tests that aren't quite as easy to do in-house. Yeah, I think that's a great, um, I mean, really, when you're developing on how much QC you, you want to do, you have to think about just how much time you have. And I think a lot of times people get overwhelmed with how much work there is to do for some of these things. And so they decide to not do any of them or you know, not really to the full extent. Um, so outsourcing some of those things can definitely be helpful. Um, we even outsource some of the things you know, here that we just can't do on a throughput that we would like. Um, and then we also use third-party testing and also to validate our tests. So every quarter we send samples out um, you know, so that we can 
we can um, you know, validate our analysis and what we're, we're seeing also. So that's a good way to do that too. Cool. So before we got a couple questions that rolled in, but before we get to them again, um, thank everybody for joining us today. This recording will be found on the White Labs YouTube channel um, within 24 hours of uh, airing. And next month on March 17th, 10 a.m., uh, we've got another webcast from grain to glass uh, with Admiral Malting. So just talking about uh, malt selection, yeast selection, how the ingredients interact. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions that came in for you. Yeah, I see a couple of them. There was a couple in the chat. I think I answered some of them. Um, so I think um, what some people were asking is like, what's the minimum amount of temperature rate, you know, rise that you would make for a good diacetyl rest? And I think um, what I actually say is that it's not really about the degrees of temperature difference. It's about actually the temperature that you have that chemical conversion of the precursor to diacetyl. So I, I truthfully still think you need to be in at least the mid 60s Fahrenheit um, to get that conversion. Some people, you know, if they do their loggers at like the low end in the 50s, they tend to see conversion, um, you know, in the high 50s or, or low 60s. But I, I have found that people sometimes need to go much warmer. So it's really more, it's not really about the degrees, it's about the actual, you know, temperature of that conversion. So generally it's, it's important to have some fermentation activity in order to, to raise, depending on, you know, your tank size to get, get the temperature and allow it to rise, um, as opposed to, you know, fully attenuating the beer and then trying to raise the temperature for that conversion. Yeah, exactly. Um, it looks like, so just to kind of put this, um, out there, if I don't answer your question today, my email is just kara, K-A-R-A, at whitelabs.com. Um, and if there's something more specific, and I know I can already see in the Q&A, there's some like a little bit more specific questions that I'll probably just um, type the answers to um, out, or you can always email me afterwards. That's totally fine. Oh. Um, yeah, I'll include your email um, in the, the follow-up that everybody gets as well. So yeah, I appreciate you taking time today. Um, it's an awesome topic and I think it's great for us to address. I know um, you and I have been working on a lot of different blog posts that should be coming out in the next uh, couple of weeks, couple of months um, that answer some of these, explore some of these topics in, in a little more detail. So be on the look lookout for that. Are there any other resources that you suggest if somebody is interested in learning more about what you discussed today? Yeah, just to mean some of the stuff that we, in terms of um, specific methods, you can check out. Um, the, there's going to be some uh, stuff on our website, but also Chris's book, um, Yeast, the Practical Guide to Fermentation, has a lot of these methods in it. And then um, there's also a great um, lab, like quality manager book um, that the Brewers Association has published, I think is a, is a really good resource also. Um, for how to sort of set up all of these things, collect the data. Um, yeah. Did you want me to go through any of these Q&A questions? Yeah, if you have any specific that you'd like to answer. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> there's a question about uh, cheap and easy ways to test aging in beers. Um, and I think that's, it's really hard to do that other than by sensory, right? So some ways that you can do that is make either to get an incubator or a makeshift incubator by keeping beer in a warming area. And if, you know, there's two ways to look at aging, right? So aging can either look at color and like the physical product of the beer. Is it going to start exploding, gushing? Um, is the pH being reduced? Those are things we can test for really easily. But then the other side of the aging is what does it taste like, right? So that's a little bit harder to force. Um, and so therefore, I don't have a, any like great specific ways to do that, but you can keep them just slightly warmer so you don't get that huge autolysis um, character and and see how they, they fare, you know, relatively um, uh, quickly. Um, Michael is asking about purchasing a pH meter. What are some things that we should look for? There's tons of stuff on Amazon. Same thing with dissolved oxygen meters. Um, and for a pH meter, you just wanna make sure that you can, um, 
you know, that there's the ability to calibrate it. And then it's also has a temperature control. Um, and it usually says like with ATC is something, you know, that's included with it. That's what I would recommend. Um, and you also have to replace those probes usually about once a year. So it's not unusual to need to do that. Um, and you, you can see that sort of in, sometimes when the calibration starts to, um, you know, waver really quickly or start quickly, but, um, what I would, um, the pH stuff is a little bit easier. The dissolved oxygen stuff, I don't have a lot of experience buying some of the cheaper items. I know some people have found that they've worked for them and, and that, and I think you might just have to, you know, look at some reviews on Pro Brewer or something like that if you're looking to go a little bit cheaper there. Um, Yes, so there was some questions on measuring DO. In terms of wort DO, uh, the measurement is usually with a probe similar to pH. Um, there are some other equipments that are using um, other optical sensors, and those are usually more expensive or you know, around the $10,000, $15,000 range, sometimes even more. Um, but using something like a probe will usually cost you under $1,500, and I know that still sounds pretty expensive. Um, and that's why I was saying there's some cheaper options out there, but I don't have personally have experience with them. Um, some people were asking how to use HLP. There's a lot of resources online, including, you know, from the media um, company, you know, Siebel that makes it. Um, we have some resources online too. Um, so I would, I would check um, that out there. And um, and then we're, people were asking in terms of specific staining for microscopic um, contamination evaluation. You can use a dye if that can help you look at things under the microscope, but there isn't gonna be any dye that's gonna really show you yeast versus bacteria um, in terms of uh, like that. So I wouldn't, there isn't really anything specific like that. There are some dyes that you can use to look at differences between like protein, um, but that's sort of beyond the, the scope of, of this today. Um, but you could use a, you know, some kind of viability stain, uh, stain like, like methylene blue to help you just sort of differentiate things under the microscope. Um, and then Esteban, you were sort of asking if the difference between anhydrin and the NOPA method. I'm not that familiar with the NOPA method, um, but you can feel free to email me if you have any more questions regarding um, fan measurements there. And I think the last one is about in-process controls. So yeah, it's, I mean, I definitely think it's normal to have in-process controls. I would like to say that there is, but um, Ultimately, and I, you know, I, I see a lot of quality people in breweries struggle with this is that they, they want to control this in process, um, you know, these in process, or these processes, right, and then management kind of says, well, that's fine, you know, it's okay if it's just a little bit more, a little bit less than this. So I think there's some specifications that you it's it's a difficult balance, right? Trying to figure out what those in-process controls are, and if they if they're not in control, what do you do? Um, and that needs to be sort of a balance between the quality team and 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 the operations management. All right. Cool. Thanks again for taking some time and um, your contact information will be sent out to everybody who signed up for the webcast. Awesome. Thank you, Kara. Thanks.